everyone! Today we are looking at the last part of Debbie Pearl's attempt at writing fiction, her book The Vision. If you thought the rest of this book was harmful, offensive, poorly written and flat out ridiculous, prepare yourself because it only gets worse in this section. It is... bad. Really bad. To get up to date with the plot I'd recommend you go and watch the last video that I made on this which gives you a recap of like all the plots so far and everything like that. I was gonna do it in this video but honestly kind of too much has happened to cover and get you up to date but also not all of it's relevant. It, I'd recommend you watch that video first. It will be linked in the video description and also linked somewhere on screen right now. But where we left off was Muslim terrorists had just blown up a supermarket while Cheyenne was trying to buy yogurt but she escaped because she saw him just before he assembled the bomb in the supermarket itself so she ran out with a pregnant woman and delivered twins in the back of her pink truck. It was a thing, so just to prepare yourselves going forward for this next part of the video, you need to expect the most vile racism so far in the next section, as well as sexism, anti-semitism, pure misinformation, fear-mongering, Islamophobia, homophobia, rape, child abuse, and basically every other awful thing you can think of Debbie throws into this book in a completely disrespectful way. So get ready for that. We're going to be dismantling it, talking about why it's wrong, why it's messed up, and picking it all apart, don't worry. So chapter 17 opens with a nice little bit of casual sexism, because of course it does. In the week that followed the bombings, the girls did what girls do when something happens more traumatic than their emotions can handle. They lived in denial. The only thing Cheyenne would talk about was babies. <sighs> I think the denial stage of grief and shock is something that can affect absolutely anyone, not just girls who can't handle their emotions. And also, can Debbie please stop calling these grown women girls, please? Magdalene is the only girl here at like 15 or so. Cheyenne is 22. Julie is 25. Bobby Joe is like 30. They're not girls. They're women. Be respectful. But apparently with everything that's happened and all the threats against these women, apparently pretty much everyone in the whole Last Publishers community thing has gone to live in the big Last Publishers warehouse together, which sounds horrific, doesn't it? Let's be honest. They aren't going back to their homes, they're all living and working on top of each other, um, and while all this is going on, Magdalene decides she wants to send a copy of Malachi's book, God's Story, back home to her little brother, so that she can convert him to their vision of Christianity too, because reasons. Now remember this because it seems like they're setting up something and this action does have a consequence later, except nothing ever comes of that at all. You've heard of Chekhov's gun? Well Debbie thinks, ooh, I'm gonna put a gun in this scene, reference it later, and then make it do absolutely nothing ever again. We're gonna throw it off stage and pretend it didn't exist. Debbie does not know how to structure a plot at all. And then we get another ad for something that the pearls are trying to sell, and I'm not even joking. Um, the book that this whole plot is centred around, God's Story, is like a self-insert of Michael and Debbie's book, Good and Evil, which they also try to encourage you to buy in the footnotes of this book, um, but they also want you to spend far more money than just on that. I mean, that book's like $25, $35, it's ridiculous, but they want you to spend more money. In this scene, since the bombing, Magdalene had given a lot of thought to their conversation about blood sacrifice and repentance. What a light, happy topic. She took seriously Bobby Joe's challenge to figure out for herself what God requires. Magdalene sat in front of the old laptop and opened Sword Searcher Bible Software. She typed in repentance and started her own word study. Then there's a footnote in which Debbie advertises Sword Searcher. It's actual legitimate software, I looked it up. Oh my god, it's terrible. But the footnote says, Sword Searcher is designed by Bible believers for Bible believers. The primary purpose of Sword Searcher is to improve Bible study and help the Christian. So I looked this up and one, oh my god, how outdated does this software look? I know this book was written in 2009, but this looks like something we would have been using in the late 90s. Actually, no, this is what the software looks like today in 2023, and it looks like something out of 2002. Back in 2009 when this was written, it looked even worse and more... I, ugh. This looks like terrible software, that's what I'm trying to say. And two, the pearls are making money from this advertisement. 
they absolutely are. And they have been for quite a while as well. So I looked up who made this and it's just some guy who I can't seem to find much about online. But I also came across um, an ad for this software in one of Michael and Debbie's magazines. They're No Greater Joy magazines. So they're absolutely making money off this product. But as well as that, then the footnote kind of carries on over like three pages with a pitch for why you totally need to buy this software. And it ends with a note from Michael Pearl himself telling readers, it is time to do your own research. And then a link to how you can buy this software yourself from the No Greater Joy website. And I'm not sure how much this was when this book was released in 2009, but today it costs $70. $70 for something that is probably essentially free online elsewhere and looks like something from 2002. One of the themes you'll see throughout this last part of the book is me saying, where the hell do they get all this money from? How are they so rich? Things like this are how people like this are so rich. They just scam people out of so much money for absolute crap products, seriously. Anyway, this whole section is really weird and clearly written by someone who doesn't have a clue how computers work. Like, listen to that line again. Magdalene sat in front of the old laptop and opened Sword Searcher Bible software. She typed in repentance and started her own word study. And she then complains that this program couldn't have all the verses on it. Why? That's not unbelievable. That's... it would make sense that it totally... I... I... Anyway. And then... Uh, Magdalene gets mad because she can't find what she's looking for and then solves it by literally just doing the same search again. Literally one page later it says, Magdalene typed repentance into the search bar and scrolled down the results. Suddenly she shouted, dead works. It says repent from dead works. I see it now. Then we get this basically like a sermon about the Pearl's beliefs told through Magdalene discovering the Bible teachings. And this part is really odd to me because it seems like what she takes away from all of this is quite selfish and harmful, but maybe that's just me. And this whole thing really reminded me of, so I was watching Fundy Friday's video on um, the Ginger Duggar book, or I can't remember what her surname is now, but Ginger Duggar's latest book. Fundy Friday's did like um, a kind of, look into what the book's going to be about and some of Ginger's interviews and stuff like that and in it Jen was talking about Calvinists and I know Michael Pearl was raised as a Calvinist although I'm not sure I don't think he follows the teachings anymore he was definitely raised as one and I'm not a pro when it comes to this kind of specific theology stuff and I'm not going to pretend to be so if you can shed more light on this in the comments please do but here's what Magdalene learns and it sounds very similar to some stuff that I heard about Calvin. Anyway, confession of sin is just dead works. We have been trying to be good enough for God that and that's dead works which kept us lost. Magdalene sprang back up out of her chair and spun around to face, face the girls. She opened her arms wide and exclaimed, we must repent from dead works and towards God. We don't have to deal with our sins. Jesus already took care of them. We just have to quit offering good fruit like Cain did and just accept God's blood sacrifice. Wow, where have I been? God has provided Jesus' very blood to cleanse me, sick sinner that I am. Now call me crazy, but to me, any ideology or teaching or belief system that makes a 15 year old girls call themselves a sick sinner is pretty disgusting to me. I don't like that, especially when that child is a victim of abuse, rape, assault, and so much more, and she's blaming herself, calling herself a sick sinner. I don't think that's okay. Um, there's a few more pages, really long, boring pages explaining this stuff, but basically the gist of it is, you don't need to do good things for other people in order to go to heaven. You don't need to live a good life. You just have to believe in God and call yourself a sinner compared to him. If you do stuff wrong, you shouldn't feel guilty. You shouldn't try to fix it. You shouldn't try to do any of that. You should just keep praying and worshiping God because the only way to not go to hell when judgment day comes and be punished forever is to just like believe in God. Doing good things doesn't work. You can't do good things and expect good things to happen. You can do whatever you want. And as long as you kind of hate yourself and call yourself a dirty sinner and believe and worship God, then you'll be fine. It all just feels very selfish to me. I don't like it. I, no, do not like. And the reaction of the women to this revelation just seems bizarre to me. It's very dramatic for like no reason. Cheyenne and Bobby Joe had quit their work and stood grinning with pleasure, tears running down their faces. 
And at this point, Yancey is also creeping around the warehouse. You know, anti-Semitic, damn Jews, Yancey. That guy. And I, I don't get the point of this scene. Yancey stepped inside the warehouse. He heard the girls' excited voices, but didn't see them anywhere. Something was wrong. Different. He slipped down the aisles between the boxes for a better vantage point. From there, he captured their expressions of joy with his camera. He didn't know what he would do with the pictures. The change in Magdalene was breathtaking. She looked radiant. Angel of light, he murmured under his breath as he slipped back out the warehouse door. So this is creepy, right? That's not normal behaviour, just creeping around taking pictures of women and children. That's not normal. Yancey is a character that I just do not get at all. I don't get what Debbie wants us to think of him because he's just so poorly written. There's no consistency to his character. It's like she wants us to mistrust him, but then she makes him do things that seem like he's learning or changing, or maybe, I don't know, like, I'm, I'm just gonna say this, he marries Julie later, he keeps thinking, oh, maybe, maybe such and such a, like, he, he gets into these Bible discussions, here he calls Magdalene an angel of light, but then other parts, she's like, oh, she's anti-Semitic, and then they don't trust her, they, like, I don't get what she's going for. This isn't like a character written as a mystery, this is just a poorly written character. Next up, Asher and Omar are gonna host a meeting at the publishers to present a new concept in missions, except everything they say isn't new, it's exactly what's been said throughout the entire book so far. Nothing is new, nothing is interesting, I don't know why we have to see these scenes, it's just a repeat of things we've already heard. But before then, they have a conversation. Asher gets mad at Cheyenne, but he's talking to Omar, um, and starts blaming her for the bombing, essentially saying, God, girls can be so dumb sometimes. Lord, help her learn wisdom and discretion from all this. Like it's her fault someone decides to blow up a supermarket. And then him and Omar start laughing at women and saying things like, gee, I thought women couldn't keep a secret for anything. And that women are, and I quote, a weird bunch of dames. It's all very sexist and gross and unnecessary and I thoroughly dislike it. So onto this talk and this meeting that they're preparing for and everything. And this is when we start to see just how much money these publishers are making. And it is ridiculous. And by making, I mean like hoarding, essentially. It's kind of terrifying. We saw in the last part that the Herb Den was making millions. They made like close to $300,000 on one product alone, one single herb, right? That means they're making millions in total. The publishers are making similar money. It is ridiculous. Um, just listen to all this insane tech and stuff they have. It feels unnecessary, right? So they have this digital map that they've had made where it shows them where they've given people the God's storybook and where they still haven't given out the book. And it also keeps track of all the languages that the book's been translated into and all the ones that it hasn't been translated into yet. And then Asher spends a bit of time thinking about how him and everyone in the town are racist, but he never acknowledges it as such. He just says, The Main Street Market, the only gas station in the small hick town, was still owned and operated by a Muslim family. The local townsfolk avoided the place like a plague. Even though the store was open for business, it looked abandoned. The feds made a show of watching the place. Yeah, blame an innocent family for a bombing that took place elsewhere, carried out by other people. It's racist. His eyes narrowed as he considered every possible thing that the terrorists might be planning. A tear rolled down Asher's face, dispersing into the new beard he had started growing the day of the bombing. <laughs> I know these moments are meant to be dramatic, but they just kind of make me laugh. They're really stupid, aren't they? <laughs> and then this is where things start getting really, really ridiculous, right? And not ridiculous in a, this isn't believable sort of way, but ridiculous in the, Actually, yeah, we've seen people with this kind of money and it's not fair and it's stupid and they could be using this money to help people, but they're not. It's like, you know, when you see those like pastors of mega churches and stuff and like these millionaire pastors and the guy who says he only flies on private jets because there are demons on public airplanes and so, that sort of person. These are exactly those kinds of people. And Michael and Debbie Pearl have like inserted themselves into this book so I can say that Michael and Debbie are probably like these and it's, it, it, they have a lot of money and they don't use any of it to help people and it feels disgusting and selfish and it bothers me. So Debbie starts describing all the safety measures that the publishers have put in place and ju <sighs> just listen to all of this. 
A 20 foot strip all the way around the last publisher's property had to be cleared with backhoes and bulldozers. After the fence came the surveillance system, including motion detectors and infrared heat sensors. It had all cost a fortune, money that could have been spent on publishing. Two entrance gates 100 feet apart with armed guards in place around the clock. It had worked out well. Every semi-truck loaded with books was checked before passing through the second gate. A sophisticated computer program kept tabs on the perimeter fence, alerting the building's occupants if anyone approached. Isaac, the Freeman's oldest son, had organised a group of young men ages 16 to 28 that called themselves Gideon's Band. These young men and boys put up four camouflage tree stands at strategic points around the perimeter on the 20-acre enclosure. During times of high alert, the boys manned the observation post. Every stand was equipped with night vision goggles and general mobile radio service. This is ridiculous, right? On so many levels. And the funniest thing is that Debbie lists all these security measures and stuff and you think, oh, well, okay, they're gonna come in handy later, right? They're gonna need this for some reason. We're gonna see the security test. No, no. These are never used. They're never needed. They're just there. Why? It's stupid. It's so stupid. Next up before the meeting starts, Cheyenne decides to go and call Rob, who is one of the guys working on getting the Miracle Jam mass produced in China. Apparently, for security reasons, email was not used for the Berry Brew business. The phone calls were planned at different times using a disposable phone and prepaid long distance cards. So terrorists apparently are fine to communicate via email, but Berry make, sorry, Jam making, no, we need something far more secure than email. So you use phones. I... <sighs> not, none of this makes sense. None of it. If you don't remember in the last part, terrorists literally sent each other an email being like, oh hey, he's coming back with bo- I don't know why I did a phone thing. Oh hey, he's coming back with bombs, get ready. It's like, no terrorist would send an email like that. And it, it, I'm exhausted by this book, okay? I'm really exhausted by it. It annoys me, it makes me angry. And when you see some of the things she writes towards the end, you'll understand why. But apparently, just in case anyone is listening in, they were careful to use the proper botanical name of each herb they referenced instead of the common name. Why is that a just in case? You realize that that's literally giving anyone who is eavesdropping more accurate information, right? Like, anyone can Google a plant's botanical name at any time. It's not difficult. You're not hiding anything. You're not speaking in code. You're just making sure that anyone eavesdropping gets the exact specific information that you apparently don't want them to get. You're making it easier for them. Mm. However, Instead of being able to make the phone call, Cheyenne accidentally catches Yancy and Julie stood in a room alone together and everyone thinks that's scandalous, awful, disgusting. How dare two adults be alone? How dare they? Bobby Joe sees them too and starts to get a little bit jelly. Uh, you might remember in the first part of the book, Cheyenne was worried about her fertility because she was 22 and not married yet, so you know, her eggs are just withering away in there. Apparently Julie is also in a bit of a rush because she's in a worse state. She's 25 years old. Ugh, basically a withered old hag already. Ugh. Um, and Bobby Joe is even older, so she's got no chance apparently, none at all. It's stupid. It's absolutely stupid and ridiculous. These women are still so young. They have their entire lives ahead of them. They have so many fertile years ahead if they do want to have kids. It's just insane to me. But anyway, point is, Bobby Joe's getting jealous, she starts worrying about her own little eggies and stuff. And Debbie writes, Bobby Joe's heart caught for a brief moment. Since the bombing, it seemed to be important to get life going soon, just in case. She thought of all the men in the last publisher's ministry. None really fit her, none really interested her. The closest to what she liked in a man was young Ben, but he was eight years younger and five inches shorter. Be Bethany, is that? Is that you? Is that... Sorry. Bobby Joe sighed in defeat. The inches really didn't matter. <laughs> well... <clears throat> the in... <laughs> the inches really didn't matter, but the age <laughs> was a problem. Grow up, child. <sighs> Unless I'm willing to wait a few years until he's ready for marriage, and if I wait, it might be too late. A sense of hopelessness surfaced. Who will I love? Who will love me? And then we get more weird comments about Bobby Joe's body. They really keep making her wait 
it's like the butt of a bunch of jokes and it's really disgusting it's really like body shaming it's not okay it makes me uncomfortable she says lord you know i got a lot of loving a great big lot of loving in this big in this big girl's body i need me a man to be able to handle the whole of me now that's how women talk right now the meeting finally, finally starts and Asha sh starts showing off the map but first Deb Debbie has to explain to us what a map is. <laughs> I wish I was joking. <laughs> um, it was like looking from space except the map was spread out flat. <laughs> it was really? Is that what a map is Debbie? I would never have known. Thank you. Thank you Debbie. See we're learning here. Learning. <laughs> there are more claims about why it's so important to publish this comic in so many languages. For example, orange lights backlit Central and South America, Asher says. Spanish is widely read in these countries. Although the Bible is published in their language, most of the people have never seen a Bible. Let's agree to disagree on that one, okay? Asher then decides to tell us why the comic is so important compared to the Bible because it is effective for two reasons. First, it's readily received and read without the prejudice that Christian literature sometimes generates generates. It goes where Bibles and even missionaries are not allowed. Secondly, it teaches as God chose to teach, through stories of God's working among men. God's history, if you will. This has been the most successful preaching method of all time. Remember, this book is like a self-insert of Michael and Debbie's book. These characters are self-inserts of Michael and Debbie. The pearls think a lot of themselves, don't they? The ego. Then they go on to talk about websites that they're building and say that all web designers looked bookish, nerdy, definitely not frontier ministry material, and Debbie consistently refers to them as geeks. That's it. It annoys me, as someone who's worked in web design, we're cool, okay? We're cool. What? Okay, I'm not. Some of us are cool. Apparently, for the younger generations, the internet is a constant source of information. We're publishing God's story on the web as each translation is completed. In English, there are millions of websites competing for attention. That's not the case with other languages of the world. The young people getting on the web will be looking for anything in their language. This is wild, right? It, she can't be this sheltered and dumb and naive, can she? I know this was written in 2009, but does Debbie not realise how big the internet is? How big the world is? How many websites are out there how many people are I, this idea that well there aren't that many websites in other languages is just i don't have words for it it's stupid it's pretty offensive it's oh, for god's sake it gets worse too right asher shrugged his shoulders to emphasize his words ah you say not many people have computers in the country i work in and even if they did who knows how to use a web or find a site but Technology is advancing by the hour. There's not a country in the world that does not have web cafes. <laughs> oh, come on. This was written in 2009, not like the early 90s. Back when I was like a kid in the 90s and you know, we used to have to go to the library to use a computer and like go on the internet and stuff and you'd like book it by the hour and whatever. Then Asha finally gets the important bit of asking for money and resources. We need wise men to set up prayer chains. We need printers, storage buildings, and people on the ground who can see to the distribution. We need money. We need more young geeks who walk in truth. <laughs> that line's so funny to me. Um, and it works too, it really does. Just a few pages later, we jump forward in time to about a week or so later, and Cheyenne tells Asha, I hear money is coming in by the thousands, and dozens of languages are being handled by the churches that are funding translators, webmasters, and printing. So the main takeaway I'm getting from this book is there is too much money in religion. Probably not the takeaway Debbie wanted us to get out of it, but it's what I'm getting out of it. The other thing is that with this money, too much money, a scary amount of money, all these rich religious people are happy to waste it on vanity projects instead of helping real people. All they're focused on here is getting their book published. That's all they want. It is a vanity project. Like, Debbie can try and tell us, oh, it's really helping people, and like, there's a miracle later, but we'll get to that. But 
you have literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, and all you can focus on is, well, I want to publish this book that I wrote because I think it's good and I think it's important. Whereas they could be using it to fund people's medical treatments, they could be using it to help people in poverty, they could be using it to help poorer families get food, heat their houses, stay in their homes. They could be using it for real purposes to help real people. And instead they're just like, yeah, but I want my comic published. Hell, they've made a cure-all miracle jam. They could be like using this money to fund making that, to hand it out to everyone who needs it for free, but they're not. They're making a comic. Mm. It's disgusting. It really is. Next chapter and the ministry slash publishers get visited by federal agent, federal agents, I find that hard to say, or as Debbie likes to call them, the feds. That's all she calls them throughout this book, it's quite funny. The feds did this, the feds did that, ooh and then the feds came. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they want to visit Cheyenne and her friends to ask them some questions about something. All that questioning, all that conversation happens off page, as all the action in this book does. Um, but Asher bothers one of the agents who is like standing outside waiting until the agent tells him what's happening. The agent doesn't tell him what's happening, he doesn't say anything, he just pulled out a paper and held it up for the three young men to see. It was a picture of a young Arabic looking girl. And then the chapter ends. And Asher's just like, oh, that must be the girl from the market who warned them about the bomb. Oh, she must be dead. I bet they killed her. And there's all these assumptions made without the federal agents actually saying anything or telling them anything. We we it's stupidly written. It's really, really stupid. <sighs> but here's another thing that, like, I didn't notice at first until my partner pointed out that really, really bothers me now, having read through this book far too many times. A young Arabic looking girl. Do you notice that? Debbie keeps referring to people as the Arabic man, the Arabic looking girl. This is completely inaccurate. You cannot be an Arabic person. Arabic is only used to refer to the language. Arabian is used to refer to geographical location and Arab is used to refer to people. It should be an Arab girl, the Arabic language, the Arabian land, country, whatever you want to say. To say an Arabic girl makes no sense. It is inaccurate. And it seems like a small thing, but like, come on, Debbie. I fact checked this in 30 seconds. You're writing a book. You have the time to do this. Sort yourself out. Next up, the chapter opens with Magdalene baking cookies. She keeps calling Bobby Joe Bojo, <laughs> which kept making me think of Boris Johnson, which made me hate Bobby Joe's character even more. <laughs> if you're American and not that familiar with Boris Johnson, you're lucky. Keep it that way. <laughs> He is... let's... let's not go there. Then there's more scenes of Bobby Joe just booming and screeching at Magdalene. Or why not just talk like adults? God, this character annoys me. Um, there's another big anti-abortion rant about Magdalene having aborted her baby and how she regrets it so much and all of that stuff. Um, but these thoughts are broken up by Bobby Joe literally threatening to, and I quote, Come back there and body slam you unless Magdalene brings her cookies she's baked. How is this a 30 year old woman? How is this a woman my age? I can't imagine at this point in my life screeching and physically threatening a 15 year old because I want cookies. It just... Magdalene then starts complaining again that Tess and Omar want her to call her dad. Bobby Joe starts telling her to do it too. Remember, Magdalene's dad is the white supremacist who is a crazy, horrible abuser. Um, Magdalene literally says to remind us, and remind Bobby Joe, you know my dad is a white supremacist. My dad believes mixed race children are mongrels. Remember, he wanted to kill his own grandbaby and he doesn't believe in abortion. Exactly. Awful, 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 awful man. It's okay that she doesn't want to be in contact with him and I wish people would stop forcing her to do it. I wish we could just like end this narrative that just because you're related to someone via blood, via genetics, you owe them something. You don't. Her dad was an awful, her dad is an awful person, you know? Magdalene has every right to avoid him if she wants. This annoys me because like, I feel this on a personal level as well because the few times I've opened up about my own issues with family online, people say the same things to me and it really bothers me. And obviously I haven't said everything because, you know, want some privacy. I haven't, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you the story of my childhood um, in, in detail because it's my life, you know, it's, I'm, I deserve my privacy. But the few times I've mentioned little things and said, you know, that there's good reasons why I don't see my parents very often or when I've like 
written poems to help myself kind of, I know, work through a lot of those feelings. Like I've written poems about my dad's anger issues. I've written poems about my brother, who was an adult at the time, physically hurting me a lot as a kid. Every time I mention these things, you get commenters doing exactly what Bobby Joe does in this book. I get told that it's awful of me to talk about my parents negatively and that, um, you know, they're my parents, they deserve better, you can't possibly be allowed to talk about your family like that, oh I can't believe you'd do this to them. I had one person tell me because I wrote those poems, I was emotionally abusing my family. People think that because you share genetic material, because they brought me into this world when I didn't ask for that, that I owe them something. When Honestly, they left me with more problems and scars and issues and pain that still affects me to this day than they ever did to help me with anything. And people still think that I need to be grateful for that. And it's difficult and it hurts and it uh, it makes me like doubt myself because I'm like, oh, well, like then maybe I did deserve to be treated that way. Maybe I did deserve everything they said to me and did to me and all the issues that I have. Like, maybe I deserve them. Maybe I don't deserve to be happy and healthy and all that stuff. But then I have other moments of clarity and I'm like, no, those people saying that stuff are wrong. They're disgusting. They're shaming victims for what happened to them. They're undermining the severity of what they, me, we went through. And it makes me so angry that in this book, everyone is like this too, because everyone piles on Magdalene until she caves and does what they wanted even though it's not right for her and she knows it's not right for her and she does it anyway and it backfires. I'm not gonna spoil the ending but let's just say Magdalene was right to not want to see her dad and everyone was wrong for telling her she needed to call him but Debbie never acknowledges this and it makes me angry. We'll come back to this. Then they have a whole offensive chat about Muslims and and how it doesn't matter if Muslims are nice as individuals because they're dangerous because they're Muslims. It's like the epitome of Islamophobia. It's gross, it's disgusting, do not like it at all. Um, Magdalene asks about the young girl who's disappeared and says, Bobby Joe, do you really believe her parents might kill her for reading about Jesus? Both her parents seem so friendly and kind when I go into their shop to buy something. They're so nice to me even though Cheyenne says they give her the heebie-jeebies. Bobby Joe's deep sigh signaled she had something to say. Nice has nothing to do with honour killings, it's a matter of commitment to a religion. We're taught to give the gospel to everyone, even if it means giving our life for them to have a chance to hear the truth. The Quran teaches just the opposite. Islam asks believers, are you willing to kill for Allah? Are you willing to bring harm to those who are your friends? Will you misuse those who do you good, even those you love dearly? Will you, for Allah's sake, kill your own beloved child? Then Islam helps believers go through with these evil deeds by teaching them to fear, not to obey. God, the hypocrisy here, right? You see it. Like, do you not see the similarities between what Bobby Joe is saying Islam teaches and what the Bible teaches? Like, are we forgetting the bit in the Bible where God literally asked the guy to kill his own son? Because that happened. So many religions have the potential to be harmful if taken the wrong way and taken to extremes. Let's focus on criticizing specific teachings and specific actions done in the name of religion, not on demonizing an entire religion not on demonizing everyone who believes in a religion, even when they haven't done anything wrong. That's not okay. But no, Debbie goes on, through the mouth of Bobby Joe. The average Muslim person is trapped into obeying or being in jeopardy of losing their life. Terror works to control their own people, just like it does with those who are not Muslim. Believers are kept faithful through fear. It's a sad fact that the average nice Muslim uses to his advantage the fear the terrorist instills to get what he wants. People like us, the non-Muslim community, are scared to stand against anything Islam demands, so laws get changed without effort. Newscasters neglect to tell the whole story. School textbooks are changed to include Islamic teachings. Officials give over to Muslim holidays. They let terrorists help them take control, even while fear controls them. And then we get Debbie flat out lying to you here. You're too young to really remember 9-11, but that morning when we found out it was Muslim terrorists that hijacked the planes, I was still living at home. We had a family staying with us. The visiting man was so upset, but he kept saying, remember, these are only a handful of evil crazed men who did terrible things. They do not represent the Muslim people in any way. We have many Muslim neighbors and they would never tolerate such atrocities, which is absolutely true. But then Debbie goes and ruins it with this ridiculousness. Later, we were sitting at a lunch table when someone from his hometown called him. I'll never forget his stricken face as he held the phone. He stumbled to his feet and left. 
His wife then comes back in and tells them, They're dancing in the streets. Our friends in our neighbourhood are dancing in the street. They said the news says that Muslims are dancing in the streets all over the world, celebrating this terrible crime. That never happened. Straight up, did not happen. That is a lie. It is a fear-mongering lie from mostly Republicans. I even looked this up on like political fact-checking sites and stuff and just, no, did not happen. And then it ends with Bobby Joe telling Magdalene that she looks really skinny. And remember this because Debbie's trying to set up a shock twist later in the book. Another twist that makes me angry. <laughs> you okay there, Koofy? You having fun, baby? It's sweet. She was just wandering under my little clothing rack and she just like poked her head out like under some of the clothes with like a dress draped over her head. It was very cute. <laughs> oh no, she's in the wardrobe. Baby Bean. <laughs> You okay in there, gorgeous? What are you doing, pumpkin? What are you sniffing? And then the chapter ends with a recipe for cookies. Not even joking, recipe for cookies. They, they actually sound quite nice. Uh, lots of gin ginger and cinnamon in there. Yeah, probably like them. Best part of the book. In the next chapter, everyone has dinner together and we get some nice little misogyny under the guise of the gender rules, women in the kitchen and all that stuff. Malika sat at the head of the long table, quietly talking with Ben, while Hope and the girls finished putting the last of the dinner on the table. Dusty sat at the end of the table with his head twisted backwards, trying to watch the girls as they bustled around. He was groaning and complaining for them to hurry, for he was a growing boy and was pert near starving. Well, you know, if you're that hungry, you could just get up and help, you know? It'd be a lot quicker if you did that. You know, maybe try acting like an adult for once instead of the spoilt child you are. Nothing much happens here, it's just more rehashing of everything we've seen so far. And then Omar pulls Asher aside and asks him, Did Yancy ever tell you anything about his assignments in the Middle East? A sick feeling engulfed Asher as he recalled the conversation. He put his head down. This kind of information was revolting. I have no idea what conversation they're on about here. If Asher and Yancy had a conversation about this, it wasn't in the book. But I don't know what's supposed to have happened, but like, Yancy's a photojournalist, right? I don't think there's anything so sinister, but Omar thinks it is because of Yancy's back. I don't, I don't know. This whole thing is weird, okay? This whole thing is meant to set up as like not trusting Yancy and as thinking that he's like a mole and he's working against them or whatever. And it's also meant to set up this like antichrist character. I'm not even joking. There's an antichrist in this world. Um, it's meant to set up this antichrist character who I think was meant to be like the big bad in the rest of the books or whatever, but obviously we never got it. it uh, this whole thing is stupid, okay? Get ready for this, it's stupid. Nice little one's got a bit of an upset tummy today. So you're not really feeling yourself, are you? Oh, I've got you. I'll look after you, I promise. He was there for several months covering a story about a Syrian Jew named Muhammad who was raised in a Catholic convent. Oh, careful, baby. I found the story last night when I was doing some research on the internet. Yancy was credited as the photojournalist for the articles on Arabic news sites. His name is all over the news concerning what the Muslim people called the happenings. I've read everything I could find on the happenings and a good portion of it was under Yancy's byline. So like I say, I didn't get what was so awful about this at first, but apparently this guy behind the happenings is basically the Antichrist. And the fact that Yancy apparently covered stories of him for work in Omar and Ash's mind makes Yancy like his biggest supporter ever and like someone who shouldn't be trusted because he, he totally loves the Antichrist or something, something. It's ridiculous. Isn't it, baby? It's ridiculous. I cover topics I disagree with all the time. Journalists cover topics and people and subjects they don't agree with all the time. It's part of the job. So let me read more about these happenings to you. Uh, this is Omar telling this story to Asha. 30 years ago, a beautiful 13 year old Jewish girl got pregnant. Can we maybe stop being creepy towards children, please? Stone that out there. Her family was in uproar and demanded she get rid of the pregnancy as it would disgrace their family and ruin her future prospects. Or you could ask, how did this happen? You're a child. Who got you pregnant? Are you okay? Were you abused? And then support the kid in their decision to do whatever they want with their own body. Stone that out there. She refused to get an abortion because she said a light came to her and told her that she carried the divine sud of God. She said his father was Muhammad. This is where I get really confused. Is the father God or Muhammad? Because one is God and the other's like a human prophet who died 
1400 years ago. Does Debbie think that Muslims think Muhammad is God? Mm -hmm. Is that? I, mm, mm -hmm. Very confused. Are you saying this is an immaculate conception? Or was this child raped by a man called Muhammad? A man claiming to be Muhammad? It, it, it's all very confusing. I don't think Debbie understands enough about Islam to make this story believable. Anyway, apparently this is enough information to make Asha think. Do we have a terrorist at our table? A Judas? Is he passing information? I have no idea how he made this jump, but here we are. So a woman claims her kid is the son of God. Yancey takes his photo for work, like when he's 30 years old, and now he's a suspected terrorist. Make it make sense. The story goes on. According to old Arabic newspapers, the young pregnant teen wandered the old parts of Jerusalem. Muslims began to fall down before her, claiming they could see light emanating from her and a high, clear sound like music. She asked someone to take her to a convent in Syria, where she gave birth and has lived with her son for many years. And then this is where it gets confusing, because two pages ago, remember, Debbie wrote that Yancy covered a story about a Syrian Jew named Muhammad, who was raised in a Catholic convent, convent. But on this page, Asha claims no one except the mother and a very old nun knew his name. So is his name Muhammad or not? I don't understand. Apparently people refer to him as the living Quran and the healer. Which sounds quite nice to me, really. There's a bunch of ridiculous numerology stuff. We all know what I think of numerology. Let's not cover it. Um, Asha says that we know this man, who may or may not be named Muhammad, speaks every language effort effortlessly without study. Even before the person in front of him utters a word, he greets them with a blessing in their own language. There have been published claims of healing while in his presence. Now even the Pope is hailing him as a blessed one. The man of peace. Muslims and Catholics are calling him the blessed one. The mother has not aged, so she still looks 13. Uh, she looks like a young woman and is incredibly beautiful. The happenings. They call these miracles the happenings. This sounds pretty nice to me. Why is this apparently so sinister? A guy who heals people, communicates well, and is bringing people of different religions together. It sounds lovely to me. What is the problem? Then Omar says, I saw a video of Yancy kneeling before the woman, kissing her hand. He looked like he was in a trance. Again, yeah, journalists do this all the time. They show respect to the people they're working with. They integrate themselves to get closer, to like cover the story more accurately and it, it's not weird to me, it's not suspicious, it's a journalist doing his job. Then there's a the whole thing about how Asher puts it all together and seems to think that this man, who may or may not be named Muhammad, is actually the Antichrist, and there's some implication that they think Yancy worships the Antichrist, so he's evil and working with a terrorist or something, I don't know. It makes no sense. None of this makes sense. But either way, no one bothers to ask Yancy about any of this, they just continue letting him be around, and that's it. Skipping forward a bit, everyone decides that because it's been a bit quiet recently, they all need a break, so they go for a picnic in the acres of land that the publishers own, which includes a full-sized volleyball court with fancy outdoor court lighting and everything. Again, how much money do these people have? Anyway, there are more conversations forcing Magdalene to call her dad, it's all very much the same. Bobby Joe pinches Cheyenne on the bum, Cheyenne asks her to stop, Bobby Joe tells her to cool it and stop being so sensitive, which makes me hate her more. No, you're a 30 year old woman. Stop touching people without their consent and if they ask you to stop, you stop. You don't blame them for it. Isn't that right, baby? Yes. She should know better at her age. Then her and Cheyenne decide to go and spy on Asher and Malachi talking because they're immature. They're talking about Asher's brother Levi come to join them, this guy who is a government volcanologist apparently. Asha describes him as 30 years old and is, of course, a Jew. We haven't seen each other since I left home. He has maintained a distance from me since he heard that I became a Christian. Then we get this absolute gem. Levi says that the day of the Muslims' free reign of terror will not last forever. With the recent advances in fuel cell technology, there may come a time soon when oil is no longer in high demand. Just look at what Ben's been doing while we've been stuck here at TLP. Everyone's vehicle now runs partly on water. Even TLP's electrical power is operating independent of utilities. Without the money from oil, Muslim countries will quickly degenerate back into... Get ready for this. Back to camel riding tribesmen, drinking milk and warring over waterholes and date palms. 
the world will no longer acquiesce to them. Can you believe this? Right? How can she write this stuff? I, I know, baby, I know. And then Levi's plan is revealed. Yellowstone is apparently going to erupt any day now, despite the publishers apparently being near to it. Um, apparently Levi thinks the large caves here and there would make a good survival point if they were properly outfitted. Plus, he knows from me that the folks in this area know how to grow food and maintain animals. He figures to establish a safe haven for a few select professionals as well as a few locals. Then Yancy and Julie walk over and everyone shuts up, but it's clear these two are now a couple, apparently. Couple of sinners. He has, he has his arm around her. It's disgusting. Who does that? Who puts his arm around someone he's not married to? Ugh. And then, please remember, Julie's only 25, Cheyenne is only 22. This is said. Cheyenne recalled the day at the creek when Julie was so upset, thinking she would never have a chance to marry, never have a baby. For a split second, Cheyenne's soul grieved for her own loss. She clearly remembered asking her mum, will there be time for me to be loved? Are you kidding me? You're 22, you still have your entire life ahead of you. Yes, there's time, you're fine, don't worry. But actually wait, no, because there's no consistency in this plot, let's jump back to Asher and Levi's plan again, because why not? Asher says that his brother and his mysterious investors have purchased over, get this, 7,000 acres of land. He's bringing in heavy duty fencing with electronic protective measures. There will be double fencing with a high speed road between for security vi vehicles. Military level security. So one, this is ridiculous. Two, again, how much money do these people have? This is stupid, stop it. He'll have money to invest in food storage, systems to filter the air, power generation with artificial light to grow plants in controlled conditions, plus very high tech survival stuff. He plans to build a kind of Noah's Ark. Oof, careful, Ken Ham will be getting jealous. Asher warns, he's not an emotional planner. If he doesn't deem you valuable, you will not be included. Great minds or strong young breeding stock are part of his plan. Now, pro tip here, but if a human ever refers to another human as breeding stock, run. Run as far away, as fast as you can, as soon as possible. Asher then says that his brother doesn't want anyone to try and convert him to Christianity because he's Jewish. I think that's absolutely fair. That's a reasonable request. No issues there, right? But Omar responds to this with, remember, Omar's meant to be one of our heroes, one of our good guys. Omar responds with, I can sure see why folks don't like Jews. Are you actually serious right now? Then on to the next chapter and everyone finally encourages Magdalene to actually call her dad. She decides the best place to make this phone call is in the publisher's recording studio. Seriously. Again, I have to ask, how much money do these people have? This has to be a joke, surely, but it's not. And then because they're all nosy and they can't get this kidney privacy, they set up the phone call in the recording studio and the telephone system was set to broadcast the conversation to the adjoining room, so literally everyone else who wanted to could just come on in and listen in to the conversation. When her dad answers, um, despite being petrified of him throughout the entire book, and just a few pages ago, Magdalene suddenly bursts out with, I've missed you so much. Daddy, I'm so sorry for not obeying you. I'm so sorry for not being a good daughter to you. I know this is how Debbie thinks she should be acting, but it makes literally no sense with the character at all. And this character shouldn't have to say any of this stuff to her dad. She then opens up and tells him, I had a really bad time. A man kidnapped and almost killed me. And his response is, not to ask if she's okay, not to ask if she's safe, not to ask anything about what happened to her, but Magdalene, what did you do with the, you were, did you get rid of the, Magdalene, if you come home, will you be coming alone? No half breed would be welcome here. So your daughter's nearly killed, she tells you this, and all you care about is whether she had aborted her mixed race baby or not. I just, I, I cannot. And Debbie wants us to root for this reunion? She wants us to think it's a good thing? I hate this, I hate all of this. Magdalene tells him that she had an abortion and that she's made some nice, Jesus-loving friends. Her words, not mine. And again, his response is, I need to know, are your new friends Aryan or not? She lies and says yes. You know, obviously completely lying about the fact that Omar and Tess, the family she's been staying with, are all black. It's an understandable line in these circumstances. I'd probably do the same if I was her. Keep the racist, abusive man away from innocent people like Omar and Tess. I know they aren't the nicest people, but 
they don't deserve an abusive racist turning up on their doorstep being racist, obviously. He then says he's coming to get her and starts like barking instructions at her and Magdalene looked at the group and smiled through her tears. This was the familiar, demanding, angry response that she was used to hearing. And this line broke my heart a little bit. This is a kid who's so used to being around angry, violent, abusive people that she just thinks it's normal and she thinks she has to accept it. And I know exactly where she's coming from and it breaks my heart. It's horrible, she doesn't deserve this. He tells her, this is enough talk, I'll be there early Monday, you be ready, don't keep me waiting. The phone abruptly went dead. Magdalene lifted her small shoulders, smiling at the group who sat around the table, but her smile could not cover the anxiety that filled her soul. Asher breathed a sigh of relief. The man just wanted to get his daughter and leave. Really, Asher? You're relieved. You're absolutely okay with sending a scared child back to the man who abused her, the man who is openly racist, the man who is dangerous and who forced her into abor an abortion she didn't want. You're okay with that. You're relieved he's coming. You're I hate all of this. I hate it so much. Then we get a scene of Magdalene's dad at home. His name is Mr. Giles, which makes me think of Buffy, except I love Giles and I'm sad that these two characters share a name. It makes me sad. So, Mr. Giles looks at the publishers online, which is understandable. I'd want to know where my kid was too. Uh, you know, make sure she wasn't in any danger. But a deep scowl covered his face when he saw Malachi's name. Filthy Jew pretending to be Christian. An even deeper scowl came over him when he looked through the pictures found under the Meet the Staff section. Omar and Tess with their children were front and centre. They're using her, no doubt about that. She's too young and dumb to realise the truth. Probably that African heathen is cooking something up for her right now, or worse than that, some lousy Jew. It's disgusting. Magdalene's mother then comes into the room and she's like, uh, what's happening? This is our daughter, right? You gonna fill me in on any of this? And he simply tells her to get the devil out of here before I backhand you. Yeah, great one. Send a child back to this. There's a whole elaborate thing where Mr. Giles contacts his KKK and white supremacist and neo-Nazi contacts and cooks up a plan. I know Debbie isn't saying racism is good or anything like that, but her using racist characters as such cartoon-like unrealistic villains seems to kind of undermine to me how serious the problem of racism actually is, and I think it's very disrespectful. I feel like people like Debbie won't look at more subtle and insidious forms of racism or take them seriously because it could be worse, it's not like these guys, but those forms of racism are just as bad and harmful and they build up over time and they do need taking seriously and books like this with characters like this stop people really understanding what the real world problems are and they stop taking them seriously and that is a real issue. Mr. Giles then packs up a bunch of guns and we see his wife is clearly an abused woman because, you know, other than the threats of violence. She stood there, a drooped shouldered testament to their years together. The thin grey woman wrapped her arms tightly around her skeleton thin frame. Why are you acting like it was them that made her run off? They didn't entice her away, it was you, so full of hate. And then he responds with threatening her with a gun. I do not know what Debbie was thinking by having so many protagonists encouraging this reunion throughout the book. He then drives hours away to the publisher's base to get there at a time before he told Magdalene, Magdalene he was going to show up. He doesn't make himself known, instead he spends a while spying on everyone and then he sees Magdalene being driven in a car by Omar, who remember is black, and Debbie nearly drops the first n-word here. I'm going to warn you now, this is tame compared to what's coming up. She uses some really repulsive language over the next few chapters. I said in my last video, and since then I've been speaking to Elise about this um, as well, and like, normally I believe when you're quoting something, like quoting a book or whatever, you should just quote it directly, because you need to represent it as accurately as possible for analysis, right? You know, like, I quote words and I quote people I disagree with all the time, that doesn't mean I'm the one saying it, it's just a quote. I don't think I can do that with this book. I'm not comfortable doing it because over the next few chapters, Debbie uses so many slurs 
and I think I finally realised the reason that it makes me so uncomfortable, more than just because of what the words are. Hear me out here, right? I get having bad characters say bad things in books. Sometimes you need a villain to say or do something horrible to show what they're like, that's completely understandable. Seeing a bad person say a bad thing is more impactful than just saying they're a bad person, you know what I mean? I get that, I get that. I have no issues with it in general, but in this book, Debbie still censors herself sometimes, you know? She'll not write words like damn or hell, she will literally add like asterisks and hashes and punctuation stuff like that so she doesn't have to type the words out. She thinks they're so bad she doesn't want to type them herself. So why is she okay writing out full on racist slurs? Why does she seem to think that damn and hell need censoring but racist slurs don't? Why does she think damn is worse than the n-word? A uh, hell is worse than the j slur? The whole thing makes me so uncomfortable and I'm not un and I'm not comfortable repeating these words out loud to quote them because they feel gratuitous, they feel like they're being offensive for the sake of it, it feels more like Debbie is enjoying having the chance to just use these words instead of using them for an impactful reason in a piece of literature. I don't want to just repeat gratuitous racism for the sake of it and that's why I'm not comfortable reading out certain passages in this book and that's why it really bothers me. Mr. Charles then admits that he's working with the local white supremacists who have infiltrated the police force so he can kill Omar and his family and not get in trouble for it. But first he has to get Magdalene out of there and so he's gonna use chlorophyll to knock her out. Chlorophyll! I know Debbie's had some mix-ups in this book. Disdain and disdain. Snub and stub. But chlorophyll and chloroform aren't even close. <sighs> this is just too much. Back at Magdalene's parents' house, her mother is a crying mess, but her brother's like, Mum, it's okay, I can hack into all of Dad's stuff and save everyone. So he does that and they say they're gonna send all the information to the FBI and they're gonna try and go and save Magdalene and meh 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 um, and, and that's it. That's, that's just it. The book that Magdalene sent him earlier was kind of meant to trigger him doing all this stuff, but then nothing ever comes of this stuff. This is the last we ever see of them. We don't know if they do contact the FBI. It's not like the FBI ever show up and like do anything to help. It's not like they ever show up. There's just nothing. What is the point in this scene? Because nothing ever comes of it. Nothing happens as a consequence of this. There's just nothing. Meanwhile, Omar and Tess have gone out and Magdalene's left babysitting their three tiny kids. And Mr. Giles decides, hmm, instead of hurting the adults, I'm gonna kidnap my daughter and murder these three innocent children just because they happen to be black. Because that's what villains do, apparently. So he uses these like stupidly expensive listening devices to like listen into the house. Magdalene's busy teaching the kids Bible stuff, including, sometimes kids get on people's nerves when they fidget or have to go to the bathroom, which makes the stuffy old people suffer. You know, like in church when they're trying to listen to the preacher. This is a lesson, apparently. Whatever. For a woman who keeps telling us to have a million kids and has characters like Cheyenne saying she wishes she could have 20 kids, Debbie Shaw writes like someone who hates kids, but then based on her books about child rearing, that doesn't surprise me. She's a monster. And then the kids are like, Magdalene, tell us a story of how Dad found you and saved you. And poor Magdalene's response to this is so sad. Like, it's filled with Christian guilt and self-loathing, and I just want to hug her. I feel awful for her. She agrees to tell the story and tells the kids, this is my favourite story in the whole world. It's the story of how someone chose to love a dirty, ugly, nasty person enough to help them become a pretty, clean, nice person. No, you weren't dirty, ugly and nasty. You were an abused child who had been repeatedly raped and kidnapped and assaulted, who'd had to live with a racist, abusive father. Don't blame yourself for that and Debbie stop victim blaming stop victim shaming stop all of it. it Mr Giles is outside listening to all this through his high-tech spy equipment and he hears the kids say how much they love their parents and then this suddenly causes him to have a change of heart and start praying he never shows any remorse for his racism or realizes that that's wrong the closest we get to him admitting any fault is him praying 
When did my children stop laughing and playing? How could I have driven this precious child away with my hatred? It's almost redemption, but it's not, not really. He's not actually admitting he's done, you know, most of the bad things he's done wrong. He's not admitting any of that. I don't think he really realizes what he's done wrong. He's just a bit sad and jealous that his kids don't love him like these kids do with their parents. It doesn't make up for anything that he's done, but Debbie thinks apparently this is the big redemption he needs. But just as all this is happening, Derek shows up because of course he does. Mr. Giles doesn't realize that Derek is the one who kidnapped, raped, and assaulted his daughter. He just knows him as, oh, look, a fellow KKK member that they were supposed to team up with on this child murder. Again, he didn't show remorse for wanting to murder the kids, did he? He's just remorseful that his daughter doesn't like it. And anyway, we get a vile, almost cartoon like description of Derek. There stood a short, fat, grinning man wearing the KKK token on his sleeve. That man was casually using a large pocket knife to clean his fingernails. In the cool, clean night air, the man's breath smelled like sewage. You ready? I've been wanting to get them little peaceful mongrels for a long time. Every time I drove this way for the last four years, all I could think about was roasting the little j -slurs. As I said earlier, I think having characters like this undermines the seriousness of more of more subtle racism and smaller microaggressions and that stuff which is a huge problem. But you also have the problem that like not all people who look like Derek are bad people and not all bad people look like Derek. It's like saying well all racists are just these ugly little smelly men. It's like no that's not true at all. Anyone can be and I think you're kind of undermining how serious the problem is with characters like this. I just Mr. Giles tells Derek that he's changed his mind and he doesn't want to kill the kids anymore, but it's too late because Derek says, Man, this thing's a hell of a lot bigger than this here house with Enslers. We're talking big. Sides, your daughter's been consorting with Enslers and Jews, so she's one of them. Too late. I already doused the place with juice and gotten her going. The house is already ablaze on three different sides. As he ran, there was a loud explosion. So this is the third bit of action we, third bit, I know, in the 320 page book. And again, it's just kind of unrealistic. The entire house is set on fire in the time it took them to have this really short conversation. And the dad didn't even notice until it was pointed out to him apparently. But then all of a sudden, Magdalene's at the window shouting, Daddy, is that you? Daddy, Daddy, please, I'm scared. What are you doing? Please don't hurt us, Daddy. Now, it's never really explained how she knew he was there, she just did, but I think it's very telling that she's in trouble and her first instinct when she sees him is, please don't hurt us. Says a lot, doesn't it? He tells her to jump out the window and she's like, no, kids first. So she starts throwing the children out of the like second floor window, uh, baby first, just hoping the dad's gonna catch them. So that's something. Apparently all the kids are fine. I'm not sure the average baby could survive being thrown out of a window, but here we are. Um, the kids do all get out safe, the dad locks them in his van to be extra safe or something, and then he tries to get Magdalene to jump too, but just as he's about to, Derek decides to shoot her, she falls from the window and lays dying on the ground, and in the least emotional death scene I've ever read, she fell and fell and fell, as if falling from a thousand miles high. Finally, he caught his daughter in his arms. Hey Goldilocks, daddy's here. Little twerp. Tell daddy you love him too. Sorry, but does Debbie realize that twerp is not a term of endearment? This has given me the same vibes as my ex who thought You're So Vain was a love song. And the other one who thought The Great Gatsby was quite a sweet little love story. <laughs> Can we all just not? Derek then starts waving his gun around some more and throwing more racist slurs around. So Mr. Charles shoots him four times and he dies. That's fair, no big loss. Still doesn't redeem Mr. Giles as a character to me, but here we are. So the bad guy's dead, Magdalene's dead, only now do the heroes of our story actually show up. You know, like Asher, who the blurb of this book said was the main hero of this story, that this story was supposed to be about. He finally turns up with Omar. Omar tries to ruin the burning building because he thinks his kids are in there. Asher's like, no, you'll die, go, don't go in there. Omar kicks him in the head and knocks him out. So Asher miss misses every single thing that happens because he's knocked out on the floor. Asher's in literally none of the action scenes in this book. He literally does nothing for the plot. He doesn't move any plot along in any way. 
he's in another country for half the book, or knocked unconscious, or running around a forest and able to do anything, just like, what is the point of him? Omar doesn't go into the house, um, but he finds his kids in the van, and one more time, Mr. Giles says to Cheyenne, uh, not Cheyenne, Magdalene, Daddy's got you, Daddy loves his little twerp, and then Magdalene dies, and we never hear about Mr. Giles ever again. That's his character, done, gone, finished. Whatever. <sighs> now, at this point, I was like, oh, okay, they killed off one of the main characters, now they're gonna do a whole call back to the beginning of the book with the dog and bring her back to life with the Miracle Jam, right? We saw the Miracle Jam bring the dog back to life, we're gonna see the Miracle Jam bring Magdalene back to life. Full circle, that's makes sense for the plot, right? That would make too much sense. They just leave her dead. And then this one random guy, Dusty, is asking the good questions. He's the only one. Why would God do such a thing? Why did God let that nasty, filthy scumbag kill Magdalene? God could have turned the bullet just a tiny bit. He could have caused the smoke to cloud Derek's vision. He could have done any number of things that would have required almost no effort. Why? Didn't he care? Exactly, mate. Exactly. Clearly God has power in this book, right? He sends an angel, like a literal angel, to speak to old Mary as she's dying. He straight up talks to Hope in a dream, gives her very specific instructions. He sends Malachi a vision. He stops books from burning, but he won't save the life of an actual child. What is the point? But it's okay, Malachi has answers. Answers, I tell you. Bad ones, but he tries. And these answers involve telling everyone a bunch of Magdalene's private medical information. So get ready for that, it's pretty gross. And also get ready for lots of shaming and misinformation around HIV here. Malachi says to the big group of people who are all crying and mourning, um, when should God have let Magdalene die? Should he have turned the bullet, this time saving her, then stopped the car from crashing five years from now? Should he have kept her from getting cervical cancer at 45 years old, or stopped her having a stroke at 68? Well, if he's all loving and powerful, then why wouldn't he? Is God more merciful to let her live a long time before she dies? Is he unjust to let her die so young? No and yes. Apparently, it doesn't matter when you die because no one visiting the cemetery much notices whether they live 10 years or 80 years, which is a bunch of crap. People do notice. Apparently, it's okay that she's dead because she believed in God, so she's in heaven for eternity, and that's why they don't want to bring her back to life with the Miracle Jam. Not that the jam's ever actually mentioned or brought up, it's just been forgotten about at this point. He goes on to say, Our loss is her gain. Many of you didn't know that Magdalene carried a very heavy secret on her small shoulders. That secret weighed her heart with great grief. You remember she was fanatically clean in particular. We often laughed at her in her yellow rubber clubs and doctor's masks. No. We don't remember that because it's not been mentioned at all in the book up to this point. Never once. No. Bad writing, Debbie. She was particular for your sakes, not hers. During her years on the street, she had become HIV positive. The disease was already advancing in her body. She knew she was living on borrowed time. This annoys me so much. HIV is not something to be ashamed of. Can we stop acting like it is, please? And two, rubber gloves and masks aren't gonna stop anyone from contracting or passing it on because HIV isn't spread that way. And let's be honest, in a couple of months, like this story takes place over a couple of months, it's like a year max, right? HIV is not gonna progress that quickly in a year. And it's not a life sentence now if you get proper treatment. I'm aware this was written in 2009, so medicine wasn't ad as advanced as it is now, but still, you could live for years with HIV and be absolutely fine. Even without treatment, it would take more than a handful of months to develop into full-blown AIDS and come close to killing someone. This just isn't how it works, this isn't realistic. Then Cheyenne brings up the jam and asks if that would have helped. Exactly. If it can cure cancer, if it can cure blindness, and if it can bring a dog back from the dead, it can cure HIV, right? Apparently not. Malachi responds with, There seem to be pr some properties to this particular disease that would not respond to the brew. The brew's formula works with the immune system. Building it. HIV uses your own immune system to destroy your health. Health. Debbie knows nothing about HIV or basic biology, does she? At all. To put it very, very simply, HIV destroys certain white blood cells in the body when it uses them to replicate. Therefore, if this miracle jam works by building the immune system, doesn't that mean it's going to be super effective against HIV in particular? What is Debbie on about? She's not making any sense with any of this, is she? She, 
Then Malachi's speech ends with a whole Magdalene had to die to save her dead soul and make him believe in God again so it was all worth it speech, which is absolute crap, isn't it? Then they reveal, and I'm not quite sure why, when Magdalene came to TLP, she began to fast three days a week. Yeah, that's not healthy. That's why she was losing so much weight, not the HIV. And if she was ill with HIV, this is only going to speed up how it's affecting her and make her worse. This isn't good. Stop it. Stop. When you thought she was working, she was actually shut up three hours a day in a dark room asking God to bring his word to millions of young Muslim girls. This sounds like an awful way to live your life. And they're here presenting as like, oh look, because she did this, she's a better Christian than all of you. Isn't she great? But no, this sounds miserable and dangerous and horrible. I hate it. And then this chapter ends with a section that Debbie titles, A Visible Miracle. Suddenly the door to the office was thrown open, sending a flood of late afternoon light. Donna Reed, a character we've literally never seen before in this entire book. The storekeeper from next door stood looking dazed and almost haunted. Turn your TV on. Just turn your TV on. Asher leapt up. <laughs> He's finally doing something. Asher leapt up like a jack in a box. He hit the power button on the big screen. It was Fox News. Of course it was. Live from Iran. There apparently had been a huge peaceful rally. They saw on the screen what looked like several thousand people standing tightly grouped together. Many had their hands in the air. They were obviously Middle Eastern. Some of the women were covered head to foot in burqas and dark robes. Right in the front, clear to all, a large group of smiling teenage girls was waving the Farsi translation of God's story book. The camera panned and came in for a close-up shot, settling on one of the books. Sure. I know this is fiction, but even I don't believe this really happened. The next chapter, and why the hell is this book dragging on? I'm so bored by it now. I'm fed up. A bunch of them sit around a table and talk more about the Antichrist. Apparently the guy who may or may not be called Muhammad from earlier is definitely the Antichrist because he's doing good stuff. Not even joking. Malachi says, They attempt to supplant Christ by presenting the world with a counterfeit Christ. The Antichrist will not speak against Christ. On the contrary, he will claim to be Christ and try to emulate Jesus' character and miracles. People will believe he is truly Christ because of his great kindness, generous heart, and ability to bring peace to so many nations. Bring on the Antichrist, I say. He sounds lovely. What's wrong with this? He will have trusted religious leaders with him who will introduce him as being the true Christ. He will be well-versed in the Bible. He will demonstrate his power with glorious signs and wonder. Why should they trust this kind, powerful, wise man? All the problems we are dealing with today, such as diseases, wars, terrorists, and ev even earth disruptions, will suddenly have solutions. In many cases, there will be supernatural solutions, healings, and miracles. Again, I don't see what's wrong with this. How is he the bad guy here? How is this any different to the things that the other characters in this book have been experiencing? Did their book-burning problem not get fixed by a supernatural solution? Is their own jam not a miracle healer? Are they not calling the impact of their own book a miracle? hypocrites. So why is this guy doing great things so bad? Well apparently he's awful because people will think he's good instead of the actual god. But it sounds to me like he is doing more good than actual god so apparently this is all a test of faith from the actual god to see if people will leave him for someone who treats them better. If they do he'll punish them even more. This sounds like an abusive partner to me right? It's seriously messed up. God intends for the people who rejected Jesus Christ before the rapture to be deceived. God helps the Antichrist to deceive people by sending a strong delusion so that they might believe the lie. This is so messed up. How does Debbie still want us to believe that this God in her book and these characters are the good guys? Really? I... Then Malachi lectures Lancy... L L oh my god. Then Malachi lectures Yancy about how there'll be some no second chances. Cheyenne apparently gets all excited um, by, and I quote, Knowing God was so full of judgment was both dreadful and glorious. Is she serious right now? God has a plan that those who wait for evidence before believing will find evidence that the Antichrist is the true Christ. With God's help, they will believe the lie. Apparently, if they believe the lie, all those people will go to hell and the only people who will be actually saved are... 144,000 people, mostly, and I quote, young virgin men. This is ridiculous. So you want us to believe God is good, but he's not actually doing anything to help people, even though he can, but he's sending a person who is helping them to try and trick people into 
following him and believing in him so he can punish them. I, it, he's setting them up for failure to punish them. God is an abuser. This is abusive. How are these the good guys in this book? Anyway, at this point, Ash's brother Levi shows up, rehashes the plan that we've already heard, and he tells people, okay guys, it's happening now, let's move to the caves. But first him and Bobby Joe make eye contact and apparently it's true love or whatever. Levi also war warns that TLP appears to have a mole. And I think the implication is that we're supposed to think it's Yancey, but I don't know, we're never told, we don't get a second book, so who the hell knows? At this point, who the hell even cares? And then suddenly, oh my good guys, surprise wedding. Yancey stands up and he's like, all right guys, by the way, I'm gonna, I'm going away, but first I'm marrying Julie, right here, right now, literally. Um, the wedding is weird. Dusty stepped up behind Yancey and began to sing Yan Yancey's marriage vows, which were a series of Bible verses put to music. After each verse, Dusty waited for Yancey and Julie to answer with the proper I do. Then Bobby Joe, still glowing and flushed, stepped up behind Julie and began to sing in her strong, pure voice. And that's about it, wedding over. Yancey and Julie disappear, we don't hear from them again, we don't see them again, whatever. Uh, we do get some more rehashing of the plot from Levi, who we hear is privy to NASA surveillance of terrorist activities. Oh, is he now? NASA surveillance? You sure you don't mean NSA? God's sake. <sighs> Debbie, Debbie, Debbie. I'm. Can you tell how exhausted I am by this book? Okay, we're nearly there, we're nearly there. There's more Islamophobia of Islam is a violent religion and blah, blah, blah. Then Cheyenne runs off to get Miracle Jam for reasons which are never explained. We don't even know if she gets the jam or not. That's the last we see of her character. Levi says, a war is coming. Omar says, yeah, I'm in for a fight. And then the book ends. There is an epilogue, which is terrible and makes no sense. Two characters we've never heard of before are trying to deliver books to somewhere in a desert and they have to ditch their motorbike and hide in a tree. And then it just ends and that's it. And I was left wondering, what the hell did I just read? And that's it. I have so many questions, which didn't get answered, which honestly I don't want answers for. If Debbie did write a second book, I don't think I could stomach it. This book is offensive, it is ridiculous, it's poorly written, it's poorly structured. There's no clear plot. It just, it's a bunch of things that happen and lots of rehashing of things. It just, it's bad. It's really, really bad. But that's it, we're done. That is The Vision by Debbie Pearl. I'm exhausted by this book. I'm exhausted by covering it. I'm very tired. I think I need a nap. <laughs> I'm gonna go cuddle Kubi and make sure her tummy's feeling okay, bless her. Cause she, yeah, she's been a little bit down with her not feeling too well and she needs a good hug, I think. So I'm gonna go look after my girl. But yeah, thank you for watching today. Thank you for putting up with my irritation. <laughs> thank you for dealing with whatever the hell this book is. Please let me know your thoughts on it down in the comments below. Let me know what bits you hated, what bits you liked, how you would write the second book, where would you take this plot if you were writing it yourself? <laughs> and all that good stuff. Um, but for now, thank you for watching. If you wanna go follow me on Instagram, you can. I'm at Rachel Oates with a zero instead of an O because I'm annoying and my name was taken. I mostly post on there. That's the social media I'm most active on. You can see pictures of coobs. You can see stories about what I'm reading and what I'm doing in my life and all that good stuff. Um, if you're new here, it'd be great if you would subscribe, leave a like on the video, that helps, leave a comment, that helps. Um, and for now, thank you for watching today, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will see you again soon. Oh, I'm really tired. Goodbye. <laughs>